All right, let's do this. My Desert Island all-time top five most memorable television shows gone too soon. Freaks and Geeks, Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23, Pushing Daisies, Happy Endings, and number five, with a bullet, Hulu's 2020 series, High Fidelity. You'll have to excuse me, you caught me in a rather inopportune moment. I'm getting ready to go on a date, and I've not exactly had the best history with relationships, which coincidentally is what High Fidelity is all about. High Fidelity is, well, it's a series that we as a streaming audience completely failed to appreciate, but that's besides the point. It's a series all about those missteps and misfortunes in relationships, as well as, you know, music. Some really, really good music. We're gonna let the on-camera version of myself get ready for his date, and I, the disembodied version of myself, will take it from here. High Fidelity, released on Hulu on Valentine's Day 2020. A dramatic comedy about a Brooklyn record store owner and lovable asshole character, Rob, played by Zoe Kravitz, who has a lifetime of romantic struggles behind her. Besides the record store owner thing and Zoe Kravitz, on the surface it probably doesn't sound very interesting, but man oh man does it actually start off strong. The opening scene already had me hooked. Rob, a character who I will get into further in a minute, starts off speaking directly to the audience, like an aside not unlike one Ferris Bueller, my Desert Island all-time top five most memorable heartbreaks in chronological order are as follows. I created the association with Ferris Bueller in the two's similar narrative techniques almost immediately, which made me all the more interested when seeing just how visually these two characters are different from each other. Ferris is a young, bright-smiled, midwestern-looking, white, cocky teenage boy, and Rob is a mature, tatted-up, dry-humored, black woman that we later learn is also bisexual. This narrative technique of breaking the fourth wall by speaking directly to the camera, to the audience, is something that I subconsciously decided was exclusive for the type of guy Ferris is. So having someone who looks like Rob breaks the schema I had of exclusivity for the technique. It sets the show apart for me. This isn't a sitcom sort of show either nor is it an off-the-rails farce sort of belly-busting laugh show. The comedy in this is best shown through Rob's clever asides. Isn't it funny to think that we used to spend hours just dreaming about the lives that we would lead 10 years down the line? It's so, I don't know, remarkable. Remarkable. Or especially through the interactions between the three main characters. Oh, damn, you stalking Cat Monroe? Oh, shit! Is she in your top five all-time boohoo list? Simon. She's very intuitive. Yo, does she seem sadder than usual, or is it the sweater? Sweater? Oh my god, you about to cry. Why aren't you about to do some work? Rob herself brings a biting sort of humor to it, but all in all, the environment, the culture of high fidelity, had me immediately rewatching the series once I had finished with it the first time because of how unique and special it felt. Much of the funnies for this show are carried out through the very real and human conversations that these characters have. Stuff that I'd really hear in real life. What do you think? Do I go for a very classic floral print or a very understated but very on brand band t-shirt? I want to dress to impress, okay? Oh, oh, you want to hear me talk more about the television show. Well, we've already spent so much time kind of talking about her already, we might as well really dive into the main character of the series. She could be kind of a terrible person, almost as terrible as my anxiety is right now, but nevertheless, she's quite entertaining to watch. Rob.
Rob may be one of my favorite characters in modern television, period. Due to, in part, of Zoe Kravitz's absolutely spot-on performance for the character. What in the shit am I doing here? Rob is the resident curmudgeon, or as I said, the lovable asshole of the story, embittered by a history of failed romances. The series begins with her recalling her top five all-time heartbreaks, that she beats like a dead horse turned deader. But while we are first introduced to Rob's rather caustic, emotional side in the first few minutes recalling all of her past heartbreaks, soon after in the first episode we are introduced to how Rob used to be with her last ex, Mac. She was happy. These two performances are like night and day, almost two different characters, but Zoe manages to unite them into a whole woman who is complicated, and oof, I haven't even mentioned the twist. Without spoiling too much, that whole narrative technique of asides that Rob speaks to us, the audience, and guiding us along through the story. Yeah, she's an unreliable narrator, so pretty much take everything she says to you with a grain of salt. We don't necessarily watch Rob be limited to one thing, either. Her major story, obviously, is her relationship with her previous ex, Mac who left her heartbroken, but has now returned to New York City. He was the last in the string of her top five heartbreaks that High Fidelity is loosely structured around, but Rob has stories outside of Mac completely. For example, her relationship with budding musician Liam as he becomes famous pretty much overnight is really interesting. All right, what do you think? The beat's really fun. Mm -hmm. um, maybe your vocals sound a little um, earnest or something? Well, okay then, what, what, what to do, Rob? <laughs> I don't know, man. Um, what would Prince do, you know? Or her other relationship with Clyde, a quote, nice guy, that actually seems good for Rob. It's Rob. Brooks. From um, the, we went on a thing. We were drinking and then we went back to my place. Yeah, we had sex. Hi, Rob. Is a really good foil for her relationship with Mac, but still holds on its own as a separate story for Rob. I loved watching these stories. They make her seem that much more human. Outside of her relationships and her personality and characterization, her sense of fashion is really eclectic and it weirdly seems to be the one thing that most people remember from this series nowadays. But what I took away from this series, apart from how much I love these characters, comes from Rob's taste in music. Seriously, check out the High Fidelity playlist on Spotify, link in bio, because I can credit this show for single-handedly changing and broadening a lot of my music taste. I wasn't kidding about the music for this show either. I love it. Because not only is it all just filled with great selections, they're filled with great selections with a lot of variety. Frank Ocean, Pointer Sisters, Blondie, Talking Heads, Funk, Punk, Soul, Rock and Roll, you name it, you can find it on the official playlist. <laughs> I guess you could say music's kind of important to me. I'm really hoping that this guy I'm seeing has a very good, let's say, ear for music, or Better yet, a good sense of where to find good music. Obviously, I'm very biased and I kind of think High Fidelity is a very rich resource to find great songs. I just kind of think that having a movie or a television show with a really good soundtrack just gives you something much more enjoyable along with it to drink in while you're watching. Which, speaking of, water's done boiling, it's for tea. I always find that a very good cup of tea helps ease my nerves. I tend to be nervous a lot. I hate that I'm nervous a lot. I wish... I wish I was more like this next character. Like I've alluded to, there are other main characters besides Rob. In the trio of the main characters, the second one I'd like to talk about is Charisse. Charisse is the far more expressive, loud, extroverted character. She begins as comic relief and remains that way for the majority of the series. And she's funny. 
Divine is a talented comedian, so there's no surprise that her line delivery is spot on for Charisse. Yo, what is this shit? It's fire. It's fucking wine, Charisse. Mm -mm. It's fucking <laughs> unicorn juice. It's delicious. Her entire introduction, juxtaposing the crabbiness of Rob and the quietness of the third character, Simon, is set to Dexy's Midnight Runner's Come On Eileen, and it is probably one of the most memorable scenes of the entire series. Good morning, uh, in the introduction, we see Sharice's personality has similarities to Rob in that both are very intense, but they're also completely opposite in valence and expressiveness, which allowed me to see the similarities that Rob and Sharice shared to remain friends, but also the differences they have that both made their relationship really interesting and created individuality apart from each other. And while Sharice is probably the funniest on the show, that's not all she is. There's a sort of visionary aspect to her that the other two main characters kind of harp on her for, as Sharice doesn't actually do anything with the ideas that she repeatedly says she's going to create with. I get it, you know what I mean? We both musicians, and you know you wanna like... <laughs> Your whole music career has been about to pop off for like 17,000 years, and I'm just wondering why we haven't, you know, heard any of your music. Because good art takes time, and I'm perfecting my sound. It's written as a joke that Sharice isn't going to do anything with her musical ideas despite her dreams, and I felt led to believe that Sharice would remain stagnant in this. But man, that last episode of the show turns it around real quick, because Cerise actually starts creating. She goes from a static character to one of change. The series ends on an original song performed by Divine or performed by Cerise that's really heartfelt, and it's actually also a part of the High Fidelity soundtrack. In her change, Cerise represents being unsupported and being an underdog. Her friends don't take her very seriously for the majority of the series, possibly because of her personality and her work ethic, and neither does the world. When Cherise starts advertising that she's looking for a band, and when someone becomes initially interested, he takes one look at Cherise and immediately takes back his interest, possibly because Cherise is a black woman. In the world of modern music, outside a select amount of styles like pop, R&B, maybe some soul, you don't see too many black women, especially black women in the forefront. I was so looking forward to see more of Cherise blossom, to move past the doubts that she had of herself and that the world had on her. But the fact that we don't actually get to see anything more, any progress Cherise would have had made in overcoming all this, perhaps may be the biggest hole that remains from High Fidelity's end. What? Oh, it's Mandarin Mimosa. <laughs> Okay, fine. Fine, alright? The tea is important to me. It's my relaxant. Dates, relationships, that sort of stuff just doesn't normally pan out for me because of my own insecurities. And honestly, there's no one who gets that better than this last character of the trio. I love all three of the main characters, but if I had a gun to my head and was told to choose one to be my favorite, it would be this last one, Simon. Simon is actually one of Rob's top five heartbreaks, but we are quickly told that they broke up not because of emotional differences or real troubles in the relationship, it's actually because Simon figures out that he is gay through his relationship with Rob. So Simon is probably the closest person that Rob can consider a best friend. And he has a ludicrous amount of musical knowledge. One of the other scenes I remember really well is this educational spiel on the importance of disco music that he goes on that just is as fascinating to me, the audience, as it is to the character that Simon is talking to. So like in the 70s, the only way to get a disco song on the radio was if the DJs at the gay bars played it. That was the first time we ever had any say in the record industry. So just goes to sound of liberation. He's also rather quiet and not nearly as expressive as Charisse or even Rob, but that actually lends itself towards his character 
and even some funny moments. Roberto! Uh, I'd love to, but you know, got kids to feed. Do you though? Aside from him. David H. Holmes does a brilliant job characterizing Simon's awkwardness. He provides a peaceful link to the very headstrong personalities of Rob and Charisse. The trio have such an amusing dynamic between them, it's why I focused on the characters so much for this video already. However, we don't learn much about Simon as a character, as a person, for much of the series until we get a whole episode about him. An episode that helps cement Simon as, in my mind, perhaps one of the greatest gay characters ever. And really made it clear to me that this show ending was criminal. Another comparison you can make with Simon to other characters is Simon's love life. It's also really not that great, like Rob's, but where Rob had a series of exes, Simon's had a year-long story with one, Benjamin Young. It's also a gay story. No, literally, a gay story. A trope that I see a lot of gay characters being written into, especially with their relationships, is basically it's a straight relationship with two guys, or it's a straight character who also just happens to mack on guys on the side. But the show also doesn't fall victim to the inverse trope of a gay melodrama where writers seem to be a little bit more focused on the label of gay rather than the humanity of a gay person. Benjamin and Simon talk about being gay. Simon's talk on disco and its importance to the gay community is to Benjamin and how it's important to gay history is really interesting. For most gay characters, it feels like they are completely revolving around their sexuality, or even more often, how a lot of other people kind of seem to want gay people to be written as. They'd be written as if the writers are afraid to even make note that they are gay. Even if they're making out with another dude, it's kind of handled with kid gloves. But not here. Simon is complex, and his story is complex. The faults of the relationship where it failed come from both Benjamin and Simon himself, as Simon is, in his own words, I'm pathologically insecure. Perhaps his insecurity may result in his rather quiet, unemotive nature, but there's so much charm to his awkwardness, it's a part of him I really enjoy, even if it was the reason why his previous relationship failed. And this leads into something else I really like about Simon. Not only does Simon have a history to his sexuality that feels pretty complete, we actually get to see him move on from Benjamin. Simon starts another relationship, and it's really refreshing to see a gay character actually have multiple relationships, and even more impressive that they did it all in one season. Writers seem to have gay characters fall for the first person they meet, and they stay with them for the rest of the series. Simon breaks this cycle. It's really heartbreaking to me, as a gay man, to have quite possibly my favorite example of representation ever limited to a 10 episode run. Simon is not like other gay characters, but he's still very much gay, and I love it. I'm going to end with one of Simon's first and possibly most poignant lines. He introduces a perspective on socialization that I love. The things that you like are as important, no, more important than what you are like. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Movies, TV, film, literature. Poetry, it matters, right? And it's no good in just pretending some relationship is just gonna fucking magically work if you don't like most of the same things. Yeah, call me shallow, it's the yeah. fucking truth. While Rob isn't exactly the greatest woman, she is a very complex character that's extremely entertaining to watch, brought to life by Zoe Kravitz, a very natural casting. Divine playing Charisse was also another natural casting. Charisse is probably the peak example of a character in a series that I did not expect to have so much investment in. But I wanted to really bring attention to, again, David H. Holmes, because I really connected with this character, and there's just so much about Simon that I appreciate. Hence why this character segment was the longest. We should probably check in with how getting ready for that date is going. All right. Be honest with me, how do I look? All right, you can't judge me. Only God and Judy can judge me. This is very important to me. This date would be the first thing of intimacy I faced since the near kiss of death I had with the flu last fall, okay? I know your mind is all about me talking about high fidelity, but my priorities lie elsewhere right now. It's, I should be fair, I should be nice. I want to put out good karma into the universe. Okay, I've talked all about High Fidelity's 
amazing cast of characters, but I'd be remiss if I just skipped over its storytelling and its fascinating episode structure. It's really got this unique way of leading us along and then hitting us with that twist, and I just... Right. I'm gonna let the disembodied voice version of me continue on from here because I've got a date to go to. While the series' two strongest storytelling elements are its characters and Rob's breaking of the fourth wall, there are other overlooked elements to this show that I really wanted to make note of. The episodes often have their own unique structures to them that make them special from each other. And the show often uses music, of course, as its own storytelling device. Take the end of the first episode. We get this great slow shot into the credits of Rob vibing out to Ann Peebles' I Can't Stand the Rain. I can't stand the rain Against my window Bringing back sweet memories Yeah, when the rain The song's lyrics associate the rain with memories of a better time, a time long gone. The next episode, we learn what those memories were for Rob, The rain reminds her of the night she got engaged with Mac, and obviously that's a very painful night to remember now that they're broken up. Or at least that's what you're led to believe, because then we learn what really happened that night far later into the series, and why Rob really can't stand the rain. The next episode, episode 2, is also structured around music, this time creating a playlist. The, quote, story and the, quote, Rules a playlist must follow guide the episode along. Rule 1. The first song has to be something familiar, and most of all, something fun. The song for this playlist that Rob chooses as her first is David Bowie's Modern Love, and it begins with the lines, I know when to go out, I know when to stay in. I know when to go out, I know when to stay in. David Bowie and Ellie had his together. A line that triggers a memory in Rob, also to that same night she got engaged. A night that began on debating whether or not to go out or to stay in with her then-boyfriend. An episode that actually breaks away from using music as a storytelling element would be episode 5. It's also written by Zoe Kravitz, which is really cool. It's really unique in its long, almost uncomfortable scenes that particularly stood out to me, as they remind me of the film Mistress America starring Greta Gerwig. The film is noteworthy for its final scenes almost all being this one long, continuous, awkward scene with the same sort of uncomfortable humor. I was, that was pretend rewind, like... (laughs) Though, this episode ends with the heartfelt message of music being something bigger than any one person, a power that can't be kept or stolen especially for the people who really appreciate it. And it's made that much more special by Rob pointing it out as she's kind of a dickish character otherwise. It's nice to see that she owns music, especially as pointed out in a previous episode by a total side character. So badass for you to not only occupy, but freaking own such a historically masculine space. Then there's episode eight. (laughs) That's the episode we get to learn all about Simon, so of course, I love it. I think the writers knew just how much we wanted to know about this character because they almost tease us at the beginning of the episode. We follow Simon a bit through Brooklyn, walking home, buying something at a bodega, at the edge of our seat, asking ourselves if he's going to break the fourth wall too. And eventually, he looks at the camera for a second, looks aside, and pauses. And I keep asking myself, is he going to do it? Is he going to get his turn and speak to us? And he does, and I remember freaking out. As the first episode of the series starts with Rob recounting her top five heartbreaks, Simon steals her storytelling technique and completely turns it around, where all five of his heartbreaks are of the same guy, Benjamin, the story I've already talked about. All in all, because of each episode's unique structure, I'm able to isolate them as their own individual stories rather than just pieces of a puzzle that are dependent on each other. 
And that's another thing that I love about this show. You know, sometimes things don't always work out how you plan them to. Maybe milk spoils a day earlier than you thought. Maybe work is asking you to stay an hour extra after you're scheduled. Maybe your date leaves 45 minutes into dinner because there's an alleged emergency art project he's being contacted that he needs to help with. Or maybe your new favorite series gets canceled after one season. I'm gonna let the other version of me take it from here. Yeah, I've said this show has ended, but that's not the full truth. This series got cancelled after one season. I'm heartbroken that I only watched it after it was cancelled. Would it have been enough to have had one more viewer upon its release? Would that have made the difference for a second run of the show? I'm not sure. There was a whole slew of headlines discussing its cancellation. Zoe Kravitz even said upon its cancellation, quote, It's cool. At least Hulu has a ton of other shows starring women of color we can watch. Oh wait. Esquire also took note of how the premise of the series flipped the script on popular tropes in modern television, and fairly added at the end there that Hulu will regret canceling High Fidelity. But even better, the show didn't limit the characters to the labels of their race, their gender, and sexuality, but at the same time, their identities felt incredibly relevant to their stories. I know the John Cusack story and performance just doesn't hold a candle to Zoe Kravitz's story and performance. Now, there's a lot of people who aren't satisfied with a diverse cast if the show is still garbage. Cough the CW. But if you're hesitant about shows being lauded for its diversity and not addressing its quality, I promise you, this series soars far past the disrespect of having a diverse cast for the sake of brownie points, but not actually having them written well. High Fidelity's diversity is integral to the plot and its quality. I adore it. Will there be a season two if we make a big enough stink out of it? Will there even be enough people who care to have a second season of this show? I don't know, but being in the middle of a third watch through of this series in a month just makes me realize how even digital streaming services are afraid of taking chances. The same pitfall that network television has been stuck in for years. Yeah, things don't always work out how they are planned. Things aren't always going as good as what may seem, as the story within High Fidelity and the story of its production tell, but I can't fight against this urge to want justice for the series, to want more from it. Is that such a crime? Wow. That's all I can say by looking at the 30 minutes of edited video I have just finished and now recording this outro. You'll notice that obviously I'm not on camera, I am just behind a microphone, but that's because you saw my camera quality, you saw my acting skills, I'm not exactly the greatest with either one of those, but more importantly, I didn't really continue that B-plot past where I put it because I thought it'd be unfair to end my own fictional story on a happy ending while talking about a show that didn't get its happy ending. If you did really watch all 30 minutes of this and haven't watched the first episode of High Fidelity, which is also 30 minutes, um, what are you doing with your life? But if you're willing to take about 20 more seconds out of your life as well, my social media is on screen, it's in the bio, and maybe click subscribe. I'm not really planning on uploading any more frequently than I have, frequently put in quotation marks, but I definitely have some videos planned in the works eventually, but I'm a student and I have a job. I have to kind of put my time there for the time being. Thank you for watching. <laughs>